How's it going, Spare Parts Army? I'm your average infantryman, Chris Caffey. The heart of the hypersonic missile program is all about penetrating through enemy air defenses, but there's many ways to do that without burning $100 million, which is about how much these babies are estimated to run you. Hypersonic missiles, hypersonic meaning they can fly at five times uh, the speed of sound. Uh, right now, the developments uh, that we're looking at from a missile defense perspective are way behind the development of these hypersonic missiles. Russia launched a hypersonic missile that traveled hundreds of miles and detonated in western Ukraine, making it the first time that a hypersonic was ever used in combat. They launched a second attack at a fuel depot that very next day. Both of these missiles were most likely fired from a MiG-31 fighter jet. Vladimir Putin has called this an invincible weapon. But there are many voices in the defense industry pointing out that hypersonics might actually be a terrible direction to go in when you look at the cost-benefit analysis, at least for the US. But first, your country needs your average infantryman skills once more. No sense risking the elite forces on this one. I've issued you a pair of Raycon earbuds. You'll notice that they look feel and sound better than ever. This part's important. The optimized gel tips have a perfect ear fit, which you're gonna need for this mission. Because in order to infiltrate the enemy base, you'll have to do cartwheels through the laser security. Okay, sir, I've gotten through the lasers and my earbuds are still in. Once you're deep in the enemy base, you'll need to be lowered down through a vent past the attack alligators. Alligator, what? Well, you'll have to reach the enemy missile and disarm it. What if the earbuds run out of battery life? It has over 32 hours of battery life and eight hours of playtime. Well, how much taxpayer money was spent on this technology? Like $6 million? Negative, they're actually very affordable. Half the price of other premium audio brands. We're talking about a product with 50,000 five-star reviews here, Cappy. Oh no, sir, they've turned on loud jazz music down here. My only weakness, turn up the volume and turn on the noise isolation mode feature. Okay, I've disarmed the missile. Support the channel, go to buyraycon.com slash task and purpose, or click the link in the description for 15% off your order. So the origins of this technology might actually surprise you. The first ballistic missiles that kicked off all of this was the German V-2 rocket, the very same types of missiles that started the space race. But since ICBMs travel very high and into space, there's a ton of mathematical calculations required for each ICBM to reach their target once fired. They can't change their course mid-flight, so they're easily tracked and shot down. Militaries around the world have air defenses that are specifically designed to defeat these types of predictable missile threats. Hypersonic missiles travel at an altitude somewhere in between, and they can take advantage of this. They are able to course correct. Ballistic missiles, once they launch, they have a set trajectory, so they travel from point A on a set course to point B. A hypersonic missile, analysts say, can be launched at a very fast speed and then sort of zigzag on its way to a target. There are three main types that you need to know about. So the aeroballistic systems are designed to be dropped from an aircraft, and it's really the only type of one that's really in any large scale operational use today. The second type is the hypersonic glide vehicles, which are boosted by a rocket to high altitudes, and then they glide down to the target. The scramjet missiles are hypersonic cruise missiles, which are still considered a future system. It's been in the testing, but it hasn't yet been perfected. The reason these systems are so threatening is because you can control them mid-flight. Even if you can detect and identify them, it's almost impossible to predict where they're gonna land, which makes shooting them down incredibly hard. The hypersonic that the Russian forces use to attack Western Ukraine is known as the Kinzhal. It's an aeroballistic missile. It's been worked on by the Russians since the 1980s, but the Kinzhal had never been used in combat until now. It has a range of 2,000 kilometers or 3,000 kilometers, depending on the aircraft that you attach it to. It flies at a ceiling of 20 kilometers, 66,000 feet, and it can reach a speed of Mach 12. That's 12 times faster than the speed of sound. China is in the lead with hypersonic missiles developments. Having test fired one that went all the way around the world, or so I heard, I didn't see it happen, and it hit a test target within China. General John Hayton said that he believes that these look like a first strike weapon. When you look at how expensive they are to create, the only way it might make sense to use them is on a nuclear strike. Nuclear? 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 Nuclear on a major city halfway around the world. Unless you're looking to show off that you're cool with wasting 100 million on taking out a single tank that costs 6 million, weird flex, but all right. Anytime a new capability reaches the military, there's always a lot of hype, especially when we hear Russia or China might have a new toy that we don't. It gets even worse when that might give them a edge in nuclear war. That smells like the kind of fear that drives up missile defense technology budgets. 
delicious. But they've been around for decades, so what exactly is new here, and why is it that the Russian military has this capability and the US is struggling to develop it still? The strategy that it uses is to start its flight as high as possible without being exposed to any of those pesky line of sight radar towers, and then it loses altitude right before hitting the target. The actual air pressure directly in front of the missile forms this plasma cloud which absorbs radio waves and that makes it difficult to detect by radar systems. It's not so much that it's this invincible missile that like Putin claims, it's more like it's an invisible missile. What all this means is that the Kinzhal takes advantage of this hard to monitor section of airspace. It can make corrections mid-flight, travels incredibly fast, and it's very difficult to detect, and delivers this incredible destructive power. It's only used conventional warheads so far, but it's capable of being equipped with nuclear warheads, which is why everyone's getting so worked up over this thing. Fortunately, there are insanely expensive to produce these. It's one of the biggest limiting factors for the weapon. Defense News wrote a great article, I don't know if it's, his name is pronounced Stephen Luzi or Lousy, but he wrote this amazing article about how the dollars and donuts of hypersonics, and they outline why hypersonics might be not so important for the US to develop. Of course, it could be a case of we're having trouble making them, so we don't want them anyway, right? That's what we would say. It's like how when I found out I was terrible at roller skating, so I claimed it wasn't my dream to become the world's greatest skater ever. It was. This is my fallback job. According to Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall, he doesn't believe hypersonics necessarily make any sense at all. The United States, according to him, is focused on defensive technologies that can hit moving targets. He believes having missiles that can hit moving targets of invading forces is more important. So if you got the Chinese forces, they're coming in on Taiwan, and they're this aggressive force, you want to be able to hit that. That's where the focus should be. According to him, it's more important than penetrating air defenses deep within a country's homeland. According to Ken Dahl, the F-35 stealth bomber could strike most targets without the need of a hypersonic missile, like it could hit the aircraft carriers of China. China, on the other hand, would need a hypersonic missile to evade the advanced air defense systems on, say, the USS Gerald Ford, which is a $13 billion aircraft carrier. If one missile took it out, that would be a very bad day for the US Navy. In any event, in spite of all of that, the Government Accountability Office reported that they would spend $15 billion between 2015 and 2024 trying to create a successful hypersonic missile, which is considerably less than the systems designed to track and stop hypersonics. The Pentagon's 2023 budget, for instance, they request to Congress, and they ask for only 200 million bucks for the hypersonic defense programs, but 4.7 billion for hypersonic attack weapons programs. You're good in terms of defending against intercontinental ballistic missiles, but in terms of these low flying cruise missiles that come in at very low altitudes, very high speed, we yet have the capability, it's going under design, but yet to feel the capability to have what we call over the horizon, beyond the horizon, beyond sight defenses. I don't understand why, I guess the idea is that if you have the capability to attack, then that would mean that no one else would use it. So having a defensive ability wouldn't be needed then. Also probably because the US doesn't wanna be the only ones without this toy. I would think it would be better to spend the money on developing the air defenses that can track and shoot down those missiles instead. Todd Harrison, who's the director of Center for Strategic and International Studies, Aerospace Security Program, believes the same thing. They found out if that they're able to get tracking data on the missile, they can destroy them. But even if they lose the tracking data of the hypersonic for part of the flight, they are unable to intercept it. They won't be able to have this interceptor technology ready until probably 2030 at the earliest. So the way air defense works for the US is they have systems like the Patriot Missile Battery, which were originally developed to shoot down enemy aircraft, but software patches from the 1990s to today have upgraded the Patriot missiles to be able to shoot down and intercept incoming projectiles. America uses the THAAD system to defend against incoming missiles, and the whole air defense group is networked by a system of computers that coordinates fire and tracks incoming missiles. So every battery is aware of what other batteries are shooting at. If an incoming missile is missed by one battery, it could be knocked out by another. Hypersonics potentially make this whole system obsolete in some ways. China's considered the world leader in the middle of the road hypersonic missile category with the DF-17 hypersonic glide vehicle, which has about nine tests between 2014 and 2017 and officially went into service three years ago in 2019. Although China officially denies any nuclear capability with their missiles, they instead claim that they're routine spacecraft experiments. This is the only version of these future systems that's in service with any army anywhere in the world. And although the US, India, and Russia have all done successful tests on similar platforms as recently as this year, 
China is currently winning the hypersonic arms race. The US does have nuclear capable ICBMs, but they haven't put middle of the road hypersonic missiles into service. And there might be a few possible scenarios for why that is. Russia doesn't have air defense systems as sophisticated as the United States. With the US investing so much in technologies that can shoot down missiles mid-flight, it gives China and Russia a big incentive to create solutions to bypass that Iron Dome. Russia and China don't necessarily have that. If Russia and China's air defense abilities are known to be lacking, then why develop expensive technologies to create faster hypersonic missiles? It's overkill. It's OP. OP overpowered as they say. So why do that when they already can't defend against regular ICBMs? Or maybe when the Soviet Union collapsed in the 1990s, the US didn't really have any adversaries that could defend against ICBMs or cruise missiles, and so the US just sat on their laurels instead of developing new missiles. There were a number of failed tests in April, July, and December. All of them had to do with launch process problems. It wasn't until May of this year that they had their first successful missile test. Could it be that the US missile development industry is far behind that of the Chinese and the Russian militaries, that they've already figured these things out? I want to preface this by saying there was even some confusion around the video footage that was supposedly evidence of this hypersonic missile attack, but the date on the video was apparently the wrong date compared to the attack. It would happen way before. So these advanced missiles could turn out to be a big nothing burger. Reuters did a fact check and reported that whether the weapon was used or not, the video footage is likely not related to that attack. Part of what makes hypersonic missiles so confusing is people use different ways to describe them. Like in this article, it says that all missiles are hypersonic. That's not entirely accurate, I don't think. Hypersonic simply means five times faster than the speed of sound. Most traditional missiles travel slower. The reason hypersonic missiles are catching everyone's attention is because they're able to fly fast enough that the missile defense systems like the US Patriot missile battery are unable to shoot them down. The United States no longer claims to have an iron dome protection over them. They would be unable to shoot down a higher percentage of nuclear warheads if they were hypersonic. Could this be part of the reason why many high up officers in the US military are claiming that they don't want this technology anyway? The way they're dumping billions of dollars into development of these weapons seems to suggest that they do very much want it, but that they're struggling to achieve it.